Thank you everyone for joining this webinar, Adapting Lighting Design for Live Streaming with Rob Sinclair and Luke Rolls. My name is Lane Shannon and I'm a content marketing manager here at Harmon. Just a few housekeeping tips before we get started. Everyone on the call is muted to keep down noise levels. However, there is a Q&A function where you can submit questions to the presenter and they will try to answer as many questions as possible at the end. The webinar will also be recorded and the link will be made available a few days after this presentation. We do have a number of other webinars taking place over the next few months for audio, lighting, video, and control. And we encourage you to take a look at the different webinars in our Learning Sessions Workshop series on pro.harman.com, as well as visiting Harman Professional Training to see our many on-demand certification courses that are always available to you, free of charge. And now I'd like to pass it to our presenters for today's session, Rob Sinclair and Luke Rolls. Uh, thank you very much, Lane, um, and I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, uh, I thought we should we should start just by by introducing myself. Um, uh, my name's Rob Sinclair. I've been a lighting designer for a very long time. Um, we didn't really have cameras as much in the 90s as we do now. Or we did have cameras, but we didn't take as many pictures. And um, this is a screen grab of me um, moving some cable around the Royal Albert Hall in about 1994. Um, from a British TV show called Challenge Annika that um, probably none of you ever saw. Um, uh, so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about, about what we do and how we've reacted to um, the events of the last year. Um, and, and one thing that I really hope is that this, um, this presentation dates very badly um, and that we, we can get back to doing things in a more conventional way quite quickly. Um, but also using the things that we've learned and, and using this experience of the pandemic and this, and this stop um, to help us help us be better at what we do and, and, and communicate more effectively. Um, so I've been really fortunate to do um, a lot of great things of which I'm very proud of my career. Um, and I, I'm just going to sort of shamelessly plug myself for a second um, uh, with, with some of our past work. Um, this is the Peter Gabriel Back to Front Tour with the uh, crane, man-operated cranes with moving lights on the end of them. Um, this is uh, some of our work with Queen and Adam Lambert over the last 10 years. Uh, Coachella Headline with LCD Sound System. Coachella with Lord, with the set designed by S. Devlin. Uh, Florence and the Machine uh, with creative direction by Willow Perron. Um, and uh, Tame Impala's uh, Coachella Headline from a couple of years ago. Um, and also a uh, long now association of almost 10 years with, with Kylie Minogue. Um, this is her golden tour in, in 2018. Um, David Burns Broadway show uh, and with which a movie was made that's by Spike Lee. Um, all, all of this work and, and many other things that I've done that I'm, I'm extremely proud of. Um, but it didn't really feel relevant at this stage to talk about any of this. It, it, it's my past work. The things that I did pre-pandemic all, all feel very distant to me and very irrelevant. And, and, and telling stories about those shows just doesn't, doesn't really seem to be, be, be a, a way forwards. Um, and also, I don't think any of us can quite see at, at this point where we're in April 2021, um, our, our way out um, or exactly how things are going to unfold on our, on our way back to being able to do these live shows for audiences. Um, so. I'm just going to sort of tell a little story of in, in January 2020, I was in Tokyo with Queen and Adam Lambert. Um, and we did these huge indoor shows um, with them, which were really successful. And um, I noticed on my on my way to the airport on the way home that, that everyone was wearing face masks um, uh, because of the, the coronavirus outbreak in, in China. It was a really, really strange thing of from being in this quite European bubble with the show and, and going home to a place that no one really cared, um, to, to sort of be in this, this place where people were obviously really concerned. Um, and about a month later, here's our final show on Broadway with David Burns, American Utopia, with, uh, where Paul McCartney um, came and I managed to photobomb the back of the picture with him, which was a particular life highlight. Um, when we started talking about you know travel restrictions or would we still be able to do this and, and the things it's all really strange um and we then opened the Tame Impala show I think on March the 9th last year did one show in San Diego two shows in Los Angeles um and and by the final show which is is here 
I was kind of aware that this was the last time I was going to stand up front of a house in an arena for a while. Um, I didn't realize how long it had been for, um, but we kind of knew that this that, that there was going to be this this strange thing happen. Um, and and about a week later, I, I found myself completely unexpectedly living in the English countryside, looking after my mother's dachshund. Um, uh, in a cottage on my own, which was a sort of strange experience. But we all tried to, you know, in those early months, we, we, we tried to keep our team together. We tried to help people out. Um, we started to run a Vectorworks course, which we, we're still doing occasionally. And um, my colleague, Luke, who's gonna be helping me present later, um, does a great job of, of doing our Vectorworks course. And, and yes, this is a plug. And if anyone would like to join us, uh, we're going to be running it again in a couple of months, um, and we, we'd love to see you. It's a, uh, we share our process um, and our ways of using Vectorworks, and we, we've helped, I think, up over 150 people now. And it's been a really great experience to, to help us get through. Um, but we also, we also looked at all of what we do and how we do things and, and trying to keep ourselves, um, try to keep ourselves motivated and try and work out what was next. Um, and the first thing um, after that Tame Impala show that we did was, was a shoot with a band called Hertz in the middle of May, where we rented some dance mirrors and, and some Titan tubes. And um, we did this with a crew of three and a band of two. So we had a studio with five people in it. Um, I was the camera assistant, lighting director, first AD producer. I, I, I can't remember really. I think I even made the tea and got the lunch. So. You know, I did pretty much every job that was possible on that shoot, but it was a start of trying to work, trying to realize that we could start to do things in a new way. And that we had, through the constraints of the pandemic, a creative opportunity to do things we otherwise wouldn't have done. Um, and we filmed this performance book for them for a Russian uh, radio festival uh, in this strange mirrored room with GoPros and consumer cameras and and it felt really, it felt really fresh. I really enjoyed the creative control that we had over it. And the fact that rather than going to a festival or going to a TV show, we could deliver a completed package, we could deliver an edited thing that, that felt on brand for us. Um, we also did um, a performance with Zara Larson for Good Morning America that was filmed remotely in the Stockholm subway. So um, I, uh, we had to film it after the train stopped running. So. I spent all night on a Zoom call trying to direct this and light it, and work out how we were doing it. Um, and we learned a few things from doing that. We, we, we started to make mistakes and we learned that the, the, in order for a, a band to create a performance for, for a remote viewing um, and for doing this thing that we, we, we quickly realized that you're, instead of communicating with multiple people, all of whom have a communication with each other, you're communicating with single people who are at home. Um, and the, the way of making a performance that's not a music video, so doesn't travel around in space. So ideally documenting with multiple cameras, this one we can only afford a single camera um, and was, was slightly difficult to tie it together. Um, and, and just thinking of ways of communicating with the lens and communicating with a single person rather than on a grand scale. Um, and, and also communicating without feedback. Um, it, it's, it's a really, I'm sure all of you on this call have done Zoom calls that are presented on Zoom calls as I'm doing now. And it's a really odd feeling of just talking to a screen and, and not really understanding how your audience are reacting. Um, and and trying, to, um, trying to help our clients understand that and, and realize how difficult this is, but also that they still need to produce a believable performance and a, and a compelling one. Um, we went from there, we, we actually did some live shows last year. Uh, we built this truck for an artist called Olivia Dean um, and she drove around and did these outdoor socially distanced shows in England, um, which, which was kind of amazing. It was great to be performing in front of an audience again, but the reach of that was, was minimal. We, you know, we, we were playing to 50 or 100 people a day. Um, and, and although the reach that she had on social media from it was, and, and the buzz that we got about it was great, it wasn't really, you know, it wasn't an effective way for, for other artists to communicate. 
So we started thinking about what what the bigger version of this would be, what the what a what a live stream concert could be, what a ticketed event could be, and how you would do that, how you'd light it, how you'd look at it, how you how you how you produce it. Um, and the one thing we realized was that that it couldn't just be a a, a show without an audience. It, it, it's it's the, the, our experiences with Libya really taught me that. You know the communication with between performer on a stage and the audience was is crucial, and um, you couldn't really just do that and film it and expect it to be believable or watchable, or interesting. Um, so we we started to come up with with ambitious ideas, and um, this is a rather marvelous thank you to the team at fearlessmotivation.com where I, I I was looking for cheesy inspirational um, pictures on, on on the internet last night. Um, we, we, we realized that we had to present things that were ambitious and that were new and that were, were compelling to bands. Um, but we also realized very quickly that, that finding money was really hard. Um, so we've done a lot of work in the last year on, on presenting ideas that went nowhere. Um, and I'm really proud of all of them and, and we'll show you a couple in a minute. Um, uh, but but it's it's also an understanding that there's that we would be doing a lot of work for zero reward, um, but that we we had to keep putting ourselves out there. We kept having to present these things. We kept having to dream these things up, and try and try and work out how we could make. Them. So the ideas get progressively dumber as I go through the next few slides. Um, this is an this was a thought of um, doing a show at a place called the Minack Theatre, which is on the edge of a cliff in Cornwall in England. Um, which bit the dust partly because of money and partly because the weather is so terrible that we couldn't guarantee it would look anything like this. Um, here's a model for an idea of a band that would travel through a series of a very theatrical two-dimensional scenes um, from a garden into a, into a city. Um, here's some renders of a band performing on a reflecting pond that we were going to set fire to. Um, here's a, another idea of a band performing and I on a giant barge in a canyon in Arizona with semi trucks covered in video behind them. Um, and here's another idea for a band performing on an enormous pyramid in the middle of the desert, which we actually came quite close to making, but it was a dumb idea. And, and, and really, it, it's not hard to see why it's, it's, it, it's not hard to see why it's difficult to get funding for pedestrian ideas and even more difficult to get funding for outlandish ideas. Um, so, that brings me to the to the point in the story where we should talk about about the Kylie show that we we did make and the things that we learned from it. Um, so Kylie Minogue is a, a, a multi million selling artist who's been uh, making music since the eighties. Uh, she's constantly pushed herself to reinvent herself and and stay relevant. Uh, I've been working for her since twenty fourteen. Um, and she, she's a great client. She always pushes you. She creates, she chooses collaborators very well. Um, uh, and I got a call in, in August last year about her new album, Disco. Um, and this is, of which this is the cover. And, and this idea of doing some sort of launch event, um, initially there was a laughably small budget, which luckily we managed to talk up. Um, and, and this cover and the, the art and the identity for the, for the show um, was created by Kate Morass from Studio Morass. Um, uh, Kate is an amazing, uh, amazing designer, wonderful collaborator. And, and, and um, Kylie asked whether, whether I would be able to work with Kate and whether we could put this show together, um, together, together. Um, uh, and and it, was a, it was a fabulous experience um, of working with them creatively. And, and just on a personal level, um, it, yeah, I think we both realized that, that we needed to work really hard and we needed to really put our, our souls into the show. Um, we, and, and, and I think without that commitment, I don't think we would have, we would have made it through. I don't think without, without us really pushing this from the creative end, that this would have been made. Um, uh, and um, Kate also has, fabulously cute dogs um, who kept me company in, in, in the studio while we were working on this um, and, 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 and were great. Um, it was a, I don't know, I just like pictures, pictures of cute dogs. Um, so the, 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 the thing from, from which the hero image from which we um, 
we took everything was this picture of Debbie Harry, which is a backstage picture from a video. Um, and everything about this sort of encapsulates what we were trying to say, that the, the, the infinite blackness behind her, the star filter on the light, the sort of slightly cool, a slightly aloof attitude. Everything about this is, is what we wanted to build. Um, and we decided that we would build a show. Uh, we talked a lot about things that we liked and things that we'd never been able to do. Um, and one of the things that, that, that we both agreed on was that some of the most magical things that you see with, with lighting and with, with staging is um, when you're in a rehearsal room and you, you come up with an idea in the, in, a, in the pitch black space and you can never recreate that in front of an audience because it's for a specific angle or it requires complete darkness or it, it just all sorts of reasons that you, you see something in a production rehearsal that looks really cool, but you know you could never replicate. And so we decided to build a show around that, build a show around moments in camera. And here, here are some of our renders from our pitch deck um, of these walls of lights um, of sitting inside of laser cones um, and being able to, to really work with, um, with, with camera angles around lighting, of being able to play in the round, um, of not trying to create a stage. We try to create this, this, this flat space in an infinite darkness um, so that, that we didn't, um, we weren't trying to recreate a concert. We were trying to, we, we were from the beginning trying to create something that, that existed solely for camera. Um, and uh, seeing how we could work with an LED floor and, uh, and, and the angles around that, and really trying to build something that was that only existed in camera, but could also be a believable narrative performance piece from the beginning. Um, and uh, Luke is gonna speak for a minute about the technical process of putting that together, his experiences of working with me as an associate on the show, um, and his experiences of working with me and with Kate as, as, as co-directors and with Thomas English as the director of photography. So um, Luke, if you want to take it away and just let me know when to advance slides. Um, so hi, I'm Luke, everyone. Uh, I'm a design associate for Rob at Sinclair Wilkinson. And a lot of my role includes um, taking the big ideas that Rob comes up with and then translating those big ideas into renders and technical drawings that then uh, get approved by Rob to then be sent out to vendors and, and shown to clients, et cetera. Um, so the first slide is really just, here's a big idea, and it never starts off as a lighting rig. Um, it is, you know, it is many different things of how can we show lots of different ideas. I think the, the concept deck was about 26 pages or something like that. Um, so there was a lot of images to kind of filter through and figure out what it is that uh, Kate and Rob were trying to uh, convey. Um, and so this is just where I start in the render process is everything lives in Vectorworks for us um, from the initial sketch all the way to final technical drawings. So uh, this first one shows us just in the sketch phase where it, the whole idea lived on a, on a video floor in this infinite space. And then how can we integrate lighting um, to, sh to kind of support all these different ideas uh, as well as the, the set list and the album. Um, so if you just keep going through the next couple of slides, it's just a couple more angles to show there's just lots of lights, what they could be doing is anyone's guess, um, but that's where we started from. Um, and then we finally got to a point where um, in our final technical drawing packs, we've now gotten different ideas kind of signed off, and then we, find, we finally finish with, um, you know, an actual lighting rig that is usable for the entire show, not just for you know, 15 different songs and 15 different concepts, the entire lighting rig can now support um, the entire vision that Kay and Rob had um, for Infinite Disco. Um, so um, big idea. So again, the, the whole idea started in a bigger venue. Um, so, you know, bigger venue, bigger ideas, bigger space, more lights, more video screen. Um, and classically, I think the one thing I always say to Rob is um, there's always a budget cut. So <laughs> we always end up running into, we'll make a big idea and then we've always got to slash 
thirty percent of the lights or something like that. The the budget process for this show was without sorry to interrupt you though it was horrific. I think there was one day I was on I was on Zoom calls about the budget for seven hours straight. It was utterly horrible. Um, but I think we did manage to get all the way through from the original very very big idea to what we delivered with the, with the integrity of it intact. Yeah, that was the next thing I was going to jump into is I think that when we when we went through this process, as Rob said earlier, that, you know, we can have big outlandish ideas, but whether we can find the money in the sofa to actually have them become reality um, was always the struggle. So, you know, it was taking this big idea and slowly whittling it down little by little um, to get the lighting and production over the line. And so that was one of, I think, you know, luckily in comparison to some of the live shows we've done, this only took about six revisions to finally get us to a point where um, we met the number that we needed to meet. But a lot of the process was just, okay, we now need to cut 10 lights and it's figuring out which 10 lights you can cut. And then another time, but, oh, we need to cut a few ladders. So where do we cut the ladders from? And it was, I think, a constant thing over two weeks of just whittling away uh, what we could without completely destroying um, as Rob said, the integrity of the show. And I think that's always one of the, that was probably the biggest challenge and the biggest challenge uh, that we faced even with other live streamed or, or recorded things that we've done is we've got the big idea and how can we maintain the integrity of that concept through all the various budget cuts and, and Zoom calls to discuss how this is all gonna work. Um, so, we finally got into this point where we've actually got technical drawings now that have been signed off. Um, and as we scroll through, um, we'll finally get to one of a render. Um, oh, sorry, let me, that wasn't where I thought it was gonna be, but that's okay. Um, so um, this is a model from Thomas English, who was the DOP, and it was really great that um, he also worked in a 3D space because what it meant is that he could, well, I first sent him a 3D model of the venue along with all the lights and the rigging, et cetera, so that he could then figure out the best placement for his cameras. Um, and, he gave, and he was able to send us examples of where the cameras were gonna be and also show us from the camera lens with the specific uh, lens, what we would be seeing out the other end of the camera. Um, so this was really beneficial for us because obviously when we first did our original set of renders, we're just trying to show concepts. Um, but once we got everything um, signed off, so this is one of the um, concept renders. Um, and the next slide is also a concept render. Um, but between that point and us finally getting to the final drawing, um, Tom was able to send us a 3D model that we could then import um, into our Vectorworks drawing since we have everything lived there. Um, and through that, we could then start actually looking at the camera, camera angles that he was going to look at, which was really beneficial to us. So we weren't, you know, it was making sure that what we would see on camera could be as close to what we'd expect to see in real life. Um, you know, as, as Rob was saying about, you know, the formula to, to show everything, I think one of the challenges that I, I think um, Ali faced, who was the lighting director and programmer for this, was that, and for a project we've also worked on, is that the colours translate completely differently from the real life and pre-vis into the camera. Um, and so as, as useful as, as pre-vis and, and the renders were, um, there were many challenges we faced at the same time. So um, the final slide of mine uh, is, this is um, using a camera angle that we received from Tom, because there was a camera fix there. Uh, this was from the render book. So um, once we had worked through the process, we com uh, compiled a render book, and that was me sitting with Rob and um, Kate at, uh, at Kate's studio with the dogs and just furiously taking notes about what they imagined the show to look like for each individual number, and then um, churn out renders so that uh, Ali could then have a small uh, a reference um, for some of the looks that were hoping to be achieved. So if we then go to the next slide, um, this is from the final, uh, a screen a still from the final version. Um, so, you know, as, as you look between the two, we have managed to achieve 
um, exactly what Kate and Rob wanted to, what their vision was um, for the song, which was a uh, real groove. Um, but that was my involvement was um, just trying to work with helping cut and slim things down and, and put ideas into, into a previs and a render um, so that others could see it and understand what, what was going on in Rob and Kate's head um, for the rest of the team to see. So yes, that was my little bit. <laughs> Thank you, Luke. Um, uh, and and I just I, I, I'm always really happy when we look at these two images of of from that render to that final sl final slide, um, and it, it really shows how important it is with these types of shows to work very closely with the director of photography, to work closely as a team that we made sure that every light that we had was able to work for us in 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 every song that we needed it to. And that we didn't, that we knew exactly where the cameras would go, what lenses would be in them. Um, and as part, as Luke says, of our, of our previous work, we could really, really hone in and be as efficient as we possibly could with our time uh, and with our money, as, as we, we, we had very little of both. Um, the end result was we were really happy with it. Um, I, I think both Kate and I were, were very happy with where we got to. It was a real labor of love. Um, uh, our, our hourly rates uh, were, were not high, but I think it, it was very much worth it. And, and it, um, it's a, a performance that I think was, was compelling. Um, and, and we got to play with some ideas like this, the, the, with the lasers coming down into the, with the cast interacting with the lasers and the lasers coming so close to the camera. Um, the, the, I think we, we, we managed to create something that was really interesting and really felt really fresh. Um, we, we did discover and we learned a few things while we were doing it. Um, I think that the ideal length of these things is, is somewhere in the 45 to 55 minute mark. We were really, really conscious about um, people's attention spans, um, over the, the, whether people get bored, uh, how people would, would hear it, how people would experience it. Were, we, we didn't have any of the, the preview process that you would normally have of um, trying to work out whether our, idea, whether our, our, our moments that we wanted to create were going to land properly. So we did a lot of showing of rough cuts of things to people, both the artists to management, um, to make sure that, that we were, the message was, being, was getting across properly. Um, we made sure we had no dead air at all. We worked really heavily with the, um, uh, with the uh, musical director to make sure that every second had some sort of musical bed to it. Um, and we were really brutal about about editing and, and cutting and making sure that the pacing was good while still being believable as a single take performance. Um, it, it was a really hard thing to get right, but I, I'm really, really happy with with this. And, and, and I think the reaction that we got from Kylie's fans was really good. It, it felt like there were the, the, the escape that we gave them for that hour was was really um, it sat really well. We presented a lot of new music, a lot of, some older music, and really introduced them to the world of the album. Um, uh, and um, and and I, I, it was a it was a really hard experience. We were all learning very much as we went, but having a really good team as always helps us greatly. Um, and this is just a, a shot from after after we'd wrapped. Um, so um, there there were as, as I said, there are a number of things that we learned. Um, and it, it's been a really interesting process putting this together. Um, it's the thing that we're trying to work out now is how we can take all of these things we've learned in the pandemic and, and push ourselves forwards back into, into a world where we can, we can gather together again. Um, and the first question we're asking ourselves is, is whether the live streaming format can survive. Um, and, and I think that it can, I think there's a, um, a way of being able to create exclusive events like this one um, as, a, as a launch or as a, as a, as a thing to, to do that, that could work. Although finding finance is always gonna be hard. Um, I think there's a, um, there's a real accessibility thing of being able to take live, of, of live streaming and the fact that it is successful to people both geographically around the world, the territories that the artists might not be able to visit um, and also accessible for people that may not, for any reason, wish to or be able to come to a show 
to be able to try and reach out for them. It feels very egalitarian um, and, and, and feels like a, 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 an additional thing in, a, in, 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 our, in our library of, of, of ways of helping our clients communicate and, and play their music for people that, 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 that want to hear it. Um, it's a very strange experience watching these things. I, I, watched, um, I watched Infinite Disco with, with two friends who hadn't seen it. Um, and it was, it was a strange, strange experience. We got dressed up, we had snacks, they had drinks. Um, uh, we, we yeah, even had a disco ball in the living room, which was slightly strange. Um, and we tried to create an atmosphere that, that was good to watch the show. Um, but it was it was weird feeling so disconnected from from the other people that we knew were watching it. And uh, although this event was happening at the same time for everybody um, as, a, as a streaming thing at a particular time, it, it felt very odd to be disconnected from the rest of the audience and, and not sharing their energy or sharing their reactions. Um, and, and again, from a creation point of view, that it's a really hard thing to 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 be able to understand what may or may not work. Um, it was normally when we're building a show for a live audience, you kind of know that they're all in the same room together. So some things may ripple around or some things we rely on that, but not knowing whether someone's watching on the phone or on a laptop or on a TV or whether they're in the kitchen or whether they're on a train or however, it's, it's a very, very strange thing to know how to pace these things and how to present them. Um, I think that the the takeaway the main takeaway from the pandemic for me is that, that i've learned a lot i i no longer assume i know what's going to happen tomorrow um which which is kind of a good feeling in some ways uh, i'd probably prefer not to have had to have gone through the last year to to get to that conclusion but you know you you, you do live and learn but um from from talking to kylie and and talking amongst the team i think the thing that we all really want to get back to is um is, is doing live shows and and then this is um, us walking to the stage for her Glastonbury performance in 2019. Um, and, and this is the, the end of that show um, with, you know, this huge crowd who were all completely on her side. And, and it, it, looking at this picture, which, which she has in her office um, and sat above us as we had our meetings about, about Infinite Disco and about the stream, it really brings home how, how hard it is for a performer that is used to feeling the rush of energy that you would from this sort of size crowd to just be facing a few people and lenses and all the people that you can see are wearing masks. It's a, it's a really difficult thing to understand how to, how to motivate everybody to get the, the, the feeling of excitement that you have here as you're walking out, the, the, the nerves, the, the, that, that feeling of danger, um, and also this feeling of euphoria when it's done of how you try and create that for, for anybody, for, for us and the lighting team, for the artist, for, for the whole, for the whole team as part of a um, as part of a live stream event. It really is so different. And 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 I think even now we're we're still realizing that some assumptions that we made about Infinite Disco or about other projects that we're working on are just not really, they don't really work because it's such a unbelievably different experience and, and and everything that you have to do to try and put it together is it, it has to be rethought from the ground up um uh and i think that's all that we have um material wise so if anybody has any questions i i'd be delighted to try and fluff my way through them great rob let me start my video again thank you very much this has been really cool um so let's see here so um check our q a First one we have is, do you think live events when they return will be forever hybrid events if there is iMag already on a show with virtual and live audiences as camera infrastructure is already in place? Um, I, I think that there will be a, a world of hybrid live events. And, I, and, and as I said, it becomes much more accessible, um, both geographically and for people that are unable to visit the show and possibly another revenue stream. But I think that it has to be thought of as, as not just taking the IMAG stream and, 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 and pushing that. Um, we spoke a lot when we were building Infinite Disco about how um, we don't want, we, we talked about initially having a small audience because um, Kylie really wanted to have some people to feed off, but we felt that 
people watching would just feel jealous. You know, why are those people there and I'm not? Why are they getting a better experience than me? Why are they, you know, why is that? Um, and I think that if you're looking at a hybrid event, you really need to, um, you really need to consider that element of it and try and design it so that it is, so the people at home are getting a different experience. So they're, they're getting something that is unique and is tailored for them. I think just um, just streaming the iMag is potentially quite isolating. If I'm sitting in my kitchen, the last thing I wanna see is a bunch of people having a really great time somewhere else. Um, it, it needs to be tailored for, for me as an individual somehow. It's a design problem that I'm sure we'll, we'll be able to solve, but it's, I think it's something that we need to be aware of. Sure. Um, and that's, next one is, should we adjust lighting to camera or vice versa? Um, we should always adjust lighting for camera. Um, uh, we, it, it, it's been one of the great learning things for me for the last 10 years. Um, as, as we um, uh, building live shows is, is the fact that everyone, everyone has a camera with them. Everything exists on the, online. And when I started getting, um, when I started getting texts from rock stars in the middle of the night, who'd been looking at pictures of themselves on the internet, um, and asking me why they don't look right, um, that meant that that really made me take cameras seriously. So we 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 the camera has a um, has limited abilities. Uh, the camera lens is not in any way as sophisticated as your eyes, and you have to adjust for it. However, as with all rules, if you if you understand how things work and you have a good team and you have people who are um, who are receptive, then you can try and really push what you do with cameras to to suit your creative vision. But ultimately, the camera can only do what it can do. And so you should adjust your lighting to that. Great. Next question. How long does it take from the conception of the show to the recording? Um, Infinite Disco took um, three months, uh, but we only ended up getting a green light three weeks beforehand. Um, so we did a lot of spinning our wheels. We had to do a lot. Kate and I did a, we, we had this, um, which is why it's telling Luke, but it's always always Debbie Harry who, who screws up the presentation. Um, we had a, a presentation and we were trying, when we were trying to get funding, um, we were doing three or four presentations a week of trying to explain what the show was, explain our vision, explain how we were trying, going to try and make it explained how we were going to try and make it affordable in, in an attempt to get funding. And we only finally were funded three weeks beforehand. So the final production period was a real scramble. Sure. Uh, you mentioned working with the cameras in 3D space. What file formats did you work with for sharing data in and out of Vectorworks? Uh, Luke can speak to that more accurately than I can. I was going to say, um, so uh, I would get sent Everyone would always try and send me an FBX, but I couldn't take FBX. So it was normally an OBJ or a 3DS. Um, and then I would export. They, I think Tom kept asking for an FBX, which I could export. So um, I find it's safest to use an OBJ or 3DS. Most 3D uh, softwares will definitely take that, especially with, I don't know what Tom was using to look at cameras with, um, but OBJs and 3DSs uh, were the most successful for me. Um, Tom enjoys technology um, very much, possibly even more than we do. I think he was using Blender. Uh, just to share a comment, uh, someone said, I saw the show from Mexico. It's my favorite concert on streaming so far. Great work to everybody on the production team and congratulations. Oh, thank you very much. It's, it's great. You know, as I say, you, you just don't know. You, you, you put these things out into the ether and you don't really know what the reaction is. So it's, it's really great to hear that people enjoyed it. How large was the render book you made and what format was it? PDF, Dropbox, et cetera? Um, so the render book was actually a Dropbox folder with each song broken into its own folder. And then there were about four to five images within each one. We didn't, um, it didn't live in a PDF format or anything like that in our deck. It was purely um, reference. So I imagine there was probably about 70, 75 images um, by the end of it. Um, not all, we didn't do everything because there were, um, 
there were some songs that relied on um, lasers, uh, which we can't produce in, um, in what we have. Um, so we went to our good friends at ER um, to help us with those renders, um, but those did not exist in the render book, but they did exist during the render process. So um, those were used as references instead. Great. Have you had to work with XR and light differently to interact with virtual objects? Um, we haven't done uh, very much XR stuff. We've investigated it, but we haven't um, we we haven't done a shoot in XR yet. We we are um, partly for financial reasons, um, partly because I'm I'm old and I like physical things, um, and partly because of the projects we've been offered have all suited more working in in in, in real physical space. Um, so I, I can't really speak to that. I'm excited to to work in XR, but this for this project, um, everything we did was all created in camera. Good, gotcha. How do you light for the audience for the quote unquote audience area when there is a limited or no audience? Um, uh, that's a tricky question. Um, it, it's, I guess it depends on, on how the audience, I mean, again, this show we had no audience at all. Um, it was, partly as a creative um, decision and partly because restrictions were, you know, we, we snuck this in a week before the second UK lockdown. So, so um, uh, the, the, the pandemic was, was worsening um, as we, as, as we shot this. Um, I think it's, it's a, that's a really interesting question of, of not wanting audience areas to look empty, um, not, but simultaneously wanting to know that they're there. I think that if you, my biggest nightmare would be a, a completely spread out audience, but if you have them in pods and you can isolate lighting into those areas, I think you can make it, you can make it feel, um, feel fuller and have, it, have an energy to it. Whereas um, uh, by, by direct, by having very constrained lighting on it, if that's an answer, I don't know if it is. Sure. Uh, next one we've got is I've I'm always frustrated by some video footages of concert or TV shows where the light is awesome, but 90 percent of the shots are singers close up. What are your thoughts on this? Um, uh, that's a um, uh, I have also been very frustrated by that in the past. Um, I think the, the the there's a couple of things to unpack that. Um, the first thing is that, you know, um, the people kind of want to see the singer. Um, and it's a case of working as a team and working out when you're going to get those wide shots and working out and maximizing your lighting moments into the wide shots that you're going to have. So um, uh, the one of the great things about the pandemic, I mean, possibly the only great thing about the pandemic, has been um, being able to take complete control over the, the whole process of making television television performances, performances like this, of um, and the real, I think the power and the efficiency of Infinite Disco was the fact that, uh, that Kate and I were in complete control from the, the first meeting um, at their studio where we, we, we came up with the idea and the set list and the rough narrative and the rough ideas through to the final edit. Um, and the fact that we could, we, we, were, we were not putting ourselves into anyone's hands at any point um, and one of the things I've really enjoyed we, we have a TV performance on, on Jimmy Kimmel tonight which I shot in Nashville a couple of weeks ago um, one of the things I've really enjoyed about the pandemic is being in complete control of that so from the design to the lighting to the way that it was shot to the edit to the grade we we have control over all of that and we're presenting a a, a, a product that is completely true to the artist's vision and and their aesthetic to 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 the TV shows. Rob, we've got a question. Got a great question here. Where can we see the recorded version of the Kylie Disco Show? Um, uh, there are uh, some songs. I think four or five songs are on YouTube, um, which we can we can send you links to. Um, uh, the show was broadcast twice. I don't know what the current plans are for it, um, but I, I think it will get a life um, beyond its live stream uh, origins at some point. And do you see live shows coming back later this year? And once they're back, will they also be live streamed? 
If so, how will that change live production design? Um, uh, God, I really hope they come back next year. Um, I, I'm not sure. I'm having a real problem at the moment trying to see how they can come back. But um, we're having, um, Luke and I are, are currently drawing a bunch of things that are intended to be performed live um, at the end of the year. So, so fingers crossed. Um, and, and we're really hopeful for, for, for the return of our, our livelihoods and, and, and the, the thing that we love. Um, I, I think there will be a lot of hybrid events. I think there will be a lot of things that we take from this time. Um, and use going forwards. We've already had conversations about, you know, exclusive performances from production rehearsals that would be streamed, that would use elements of a tour's production, but would be be a purely filmed thing. Um, and there was the answer I gave earlier about how you, you know, ways of live streaming events that, that hopefully are a little more than just just iMag. Sure. And uh, I may have asked this already, but. Um, for these hybrid events, uh, how do you see that changing live production design? Um, I, I think it's it's interesting. I think we we already, as I, as I said, for for telephones, we already light and and design things for camera um, anyway. Um, but I think that there is a a way of, and I've had a couple of conversations about this, and that the, it's still a very loose thing of how you how you give people watching on screens a different and a different experience so so how you have a single performance but two experiences of it so how how it is how it is in the room and how it is through a lens and how you tailor those two things to to be true to the two audiences i think it's a really interesting problem i don't know how to solve it yet but i'm looking forward to to trying and failing a few times i'm sure 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 um, well, that is all the questions we've, uh, we've had come in. Um, so unless uh, there has, is there anything else you'd like to share, Rob or Luke? It's been a great webinar. No, um, thank you very much. I, I, hope we, we, um, I hope we kept it to, as I said um, at, at some point, that we, we think that 45 to 55 minutes is the ideal time for an online presentation. So hopefully we kept it into that. Been perfect. Um, well, uh, if if that's uh, if that's if we don't have anything else, again, as I mentioned in the beginning, we will have this presentation out as a recording on our channels in just a few days. If you'd like to go back, watch it again, or share it with a colleague, uh, we also have several training resources available, as well as all of the learning sessions that we have recorded in the training section of our website at pro.harman.com. Thanks again, everyone, for joining. Thank you again. Rob, Luke, and Brad for assisting as well. Uh, and we hope everyone enjoys the rest of your day. We'll see you next time.